So welcome today to the free training, how to get your baby sleeping through the night without leaving him to cry. All right. My name is Batya Sherizen, fondly known as Batya the Baby Coach, and I have been a child sleep consultant for almost 10 years now. I help tired families teach their children how to get a better night's sleep. And on today's webinar, we're going to go through three steps to get your baby sleeping through the night without having to use intense crying methods. And you'll be able to really begin applying these ideas for better sleep immediately. And I'm really, really excited to help you. I want to help you empower yourself by learning these amazing skills to help you and your baby sleep. But before we start, I want to go through a few ground rules to help you really maximize this training. Okay, number one, take notes. Okay, I'm going to be giving a lot of valuable information here. So please feel free to take notes, jot down ideas that speak to you, because we're going to go through a lot, and it might make sense at the time, but I want to make sure you remember it afterwards, okay? Number two, try not to be distracted. It's really hard to learn and process new information when you're not concentrating, when your mind's in a bunch of different places. If you really want to gain something here today, put all of your attention into it, okay? Number three, stay till the end. All three of these steps that I'm going to discuss are important. And if you just try to apply the first one or two independently, you're really not going to gain a full picture of what's happening because each step really feeds off of the next. So try to stay till the end if you can. Ask your questions, okay? Do we have this chat box here? A lot of you have said hello. Hi, Esther. You just popped in and said hi. Um, if you have questions while I'm talking and while I'm going through the information, type them in and we're going to answer them at the end for sure throughout you know, the whole process with everything. Like I said, I'm not going to necessarily be able to get to every single question because there's a lot of you on here. But you can always email me afterwards. I'll tell you how to do that so we can answer your questions, if not live on the webinar. And most importantly, don't stress. Your baby can and will learn to sleep well by slowly incorporating all of these ideas we're going to talk about. So let's get started. But before I begin with everything, I want to ask you why you are here today. Okay, you could be doing so many things as a busy parent, but instead you're here with us now to learn more about your child's sleep. Maybe you're feeling exhausted right now because your baby kept you up last night. Or maybe you're feeling frustrated because you know that your baby, that your child could sleep better, but you don't know how to help him, okay? If this is you, you are in the right place, don't worry. One of the reasons you might be on this webinar now is because you might wonder if you can ever wake up feeling rested, energized, refreshed. You might feel like you'll never be able to tackle your busy days again with a clear head because you're up all night with your baby who refuses to sleep. Or maybe you don't have evenings spend with your partner, with your spouse. You know, you might be trying to calm your baby all night instead. And because of this, you and your partner don't feel that strong connection anymore. You know, you used to stay up late drinking tea, talking and bonding. Now you don't do that. <laughs> You're busy with your baby, busy with your kids. Sometimes you might even feel so absolutely exhausted that you don't have the proper energy to concentrate or be productive at work. It causes your, maybe your sales to be down or you're not performing at work nearly as well as you know you can. You really feel like you're stuck in a rut. So if this is you, do not worry. It doesn't have to be like this. We can most definitely teach your baby how to sleep so your life can be better and you can function in this optimal rested place. We are going to talk about using three very gentle but surefire steps to get your baby sleeping. And once we do that, picture how energized you're going to feel waking up, rested, refreshed in the morning, ready to face your day so you can take care of your to-do list, actually get things crossed off, and you'll feel accomplished, not scurrying around tired all day. What would it be like if you had uninterrupted time in the evenings to bond with the people you love? so that you can rebuild that connection with your partner again. You know, the results could be date nights, going out to dinner once in a while, reconnecting with old friends, relationships, like you used to do pre-baby days, just kind of having time to yourself finally again. And really, if you're working, imagine how productive and focused your work will be once you have a full night's sleep and a level head for your busy day. It means your numbers will be up again, your boss will love you, and maybe you'll even be on time to your meetings. <laughs> you know, your creative juices will be flowing, and you'll just enjoy work. And if you're not working, Honestly, parenting is a full-time job in and of itself, and just having a clear head to concentrate at the busy tasks at hand. So I wanna just tell you, the only way to get from where you are right now and where you wanna be is by regaining control of your sleep and your life, by applying the methods that we're gonna talk about with getting your baby to sleep. It is not unrealistic at all to have energy, time with the people that you love in your life. You know, But in order to do that, you really have to work with a solid foundation, just like the picture of this pyramid here. You don't just start at the beautiful top at the point. You have to work hard on a really strong, sturdy foundation and work your way up. And 
you know, when you're making a building or a skyscraper, you don't start on the seventh floor or the 18th floor or even the second floor. You start with a solid foundation. And that's what this three-step solution is going to help you do. Build a solid foundation in your home with your child's sleep. But before I begin getting to these long-awaited steps, I want to just tell you a little bit about my story, how I came to do what I do, because a lot of things I say will probably identify with you and your current situation. So let me take you back to August 2006. Okay, I was living in an apartment with my husband and baby. My baby was 10 months old and we were all absolutely exhausted. It was 1 a.m. and I spent almost two hours for the umpteenth time it must have been trying to get my baby to sleep. I remember I had tried feeding him, he wasn't hungry. I tried holding him, he was too squirmy. I even tried talking to him and taking him for a walk and nothing was working. I was on the edge. I needed to do something now to get him to sleep. How many of you have ever felt like that? Not coping at that very scary place of needing sleep and needing it now? So guess what I did? Anything any sleep deprived, deprived mother would have done, I desperately looked for a distraction. I scooped up my baby, brought him to the messy kitchen that happened to look like a tornado had hit. There was spaghetti strewn all over the counters, pots and pans left over from last night's dinner. It was a mess because my goodness, who has time to clean up when you are so tired? I opened up all the cabinets looking for something to save me, and finally there it was, the box of Cheerios. Oh, thank God, okay? I grabbed the box of Cheerios, scooped up my baby, brought him into the living room, and continued to dump the entire contents of the Cheerios box onto the floor. I found a blanket, collapsed on the couch, and prayed that my baby would be entertained for as long as possible to catch some sleep. Batya, what's going on? Batya, hello, wake up, can you hear me? It's almost 3 a.m. The entire living room looks like Hurricane Cheerios is it. There is cereal all over the floor. It's stuck to the baby's cheeks and you're sleeping on the couch. I know you're tired, Batya, but this isn't normal. There has to be a better way to get some rest. Something has to change. Can you relate to this? Being so drained from your baby's back to sleep and knowing that you're absolutely at the end of your rope. Let's fast forward three months, okay? We're still living in our same apartment, but right now it's 6.30 a.m. and I had gone to sleep the night before at 11 p.m. Good morning, wake up. It's time to go to work. That was the sound of me actually waking my husband up. What, what's going on? What time is it? And why are you smiling like that? The baby slept through the night, the entire night. Can you believe it? It was an absolute blissful moment. The first time my baby slept through the night. Can you imagine what that felt like? Finally having seven hours of sleep behind me and waking up in the morning actually feeling rested. At that moment, I knew that I was absolutely onto something. Let's fast forward another two years. At that point, I had not only helped my baby, but I had actually worked with many other families as well. But have you ever felt absolutely stumped with a situation, a problem that almost seems unsolvable? I remember it so vividly. One morning at 9.30 a.m., I was sitting down to enjoy my morning coffee when I got the call that changed my life. You know that moment you realize there's way more potential than you ever even dreamed? Batya, you're a miracle worker. Ryan slept beautifully for the past three nights. Wow, I was speechless. But you know, when I called you four weeks ago, I never would have believed he could do it. It used to take two hours at bedtime for him to calm down. He was jumping off dressers, beating his head against the wall, running in and out of the room. He would just pass out on the floor eventually. Do some of you think that you have the worst sleeper that can possibly exist? This mother felt that way and didn't think anyone would be able to help her. But honestly, with this child, I finally felt like I'd cracked the code. I had helped the nightmare child, the child that would never learn to sleep. I helped him fall asleep easily and calmly at bedtime without crying, and he slept through the night. It took a few weeks of hard work, but I knew at that moment if I could help him sleep, I could help anybody sleep. And now it's 10 years later, and I run a full-time consulting service helping families all over the world. I do personalized one-on-one -on -one coaching with families all the time, and we get to the root of their child's sleep problems and solve them. I love my business. It doesn't even feel like a job because it's the greatest passion for me in the world, helping empower fellow parents to get sleep so that they can be the best, most rested, refreshed parents of the world to take care of their kids. I work with kids like Beckham, the cute guy, seven months old when his parents contacted me, and they had tried everything, leaving him to cry it out, checking systems, picking him up, putting him down, nothing was working. We worked together for four weeks, not only got him sleeping through the night, but sleeping in his own crib, in his own room. The parents were filled. Okay, so back to you. That's a little bit about my story, okay? Let's talk about the problems you might potentially face 
tackling your baby's sleep. All right, that was my story, how I got into sleep, how I became the baby coach. But let's talk about what potential challenges you might face and how we're gonna solve them helping your child sleep. Number one is where to start and how to start. Should you go full force with tackling your baby's sleep in one go? Do you put your baby in a crib and just start from there? How do you begin teaching your baby to sleep? Do you start with naps, middle of the night? Where and when do you even begin all of this? Number two, will it work for my baby? Is something you might be thinking. Okay, you might have read success stories in a mom's Facebook group about how your friend's baby did great with that method or this, me this method, but you might feel like it's not gonna work for your baby. What about your baby's temperament? your baby's philosophy, your baby sleep needs? What about your parenting philosophy and what you feel is important? Is it gonna work with my baby, a lot of people wonder. And last but not least, what about the future? You know, once you do figure all this out and get your baby sleeping, how do you know it's gonna work for the future? Just because you get your baby sleeping well now, what do you do if problems arise? Do you have to start all over again? Let's just sum up these three problems, okay? Number one, starting. Where to start, how to start, what to do, Number two, my baby. Is it gonna work with my baby in my home with my dynamics and my parenting philosophy? Because you never wanna compromise that. Number three, the future. Once you do get your child sleeping so well, how do you prevent problems from arising or how do you deal with them so you don't have to start over every time an issue arises with your child's sleep? So what we wanna have are long-term solutions with what we do, okay? Asking these questions is great because they address the key fundamental points that people encounter when they teach their kids to sleep. They are common stumbling blocks. You have to know how to deal with them to teach your child how to sleep if you want to have long lasting results. When I first started my coaching practice 10 years ago, I found that a lot of families lacked these understanding these issues and really getting to the root of them because we want to solve the root of the problem. We don't just want to solve a symptom of the problem, like a picture here of this tree. We don't want to just cut off a branch and say, well, it's fixed because the branch is going to grow back. We want to get deep to the root, to the foundation, make sure that's really solidified so that way we can move forward really well. So what I have created, which is the whole webinar we're going to go through here, is what I call the serenity sleep solution. What we do is, number one, routine. That is where we start with building this foundation with the ground up. That's answering that first question, where to start, how to start, when to start. You first start with a solid routine. That's the first part of this whole training, what we're gonna go through and how to establish a routine and what a routine is. Once you have that set up, then you go to independent sleeping, this middle cloud here. How, in a gentle, slow, loving fashion based on your baby's personality and what you feel is important and not compromising anything, how do you respond to your child and how do you actually teach them to learn to sleep through the night or learn to get more qualitative sleep? And then once you have that, we move on to the sleep line, which is fusing all sleep together for the future to make sure that it fits really, really well. And now I'm gonna go through all three of these steps. You're gonna learn how you can apply them to help your child sleep. And by the end of today's webinar, you are going to have a blueprint to work with to get the sleep you need. All right, so I'm sure you're excited. <laughs> Let's start with actually the practical tips of what we're gonna do. We're gonna start here with routine. And the step we're gonna talk about with routine is like I said, foundations of sleep, getting this really solid baseline set up so you can confidently know what your child's sleep needs are to move forward because it is the absolute first place to start. So let's talk about what the importance of a routine is. The biggest problem parents encounter when teaching their kids to sleep, like I told you, is when to start and how to start. Naps, bedtime, middle of the night, all in one go. You know, these questions are critical. But before you do that, you have to first figure out the optimal time to introduce anything before you can move forward. What do I mean by that? All sleep is a 24 hour cycle, okay? It's all encompassing. It's a rolling cycle, really. Day affects night, which affects the following day, and so on and so forth. And the general rule is that sleep induces sleep. And the better rested a child is, the more qualitative sleep they're gonna get, the more they're gonna sleep well, the less nap fighting they're gonna have. They're gonna wake up refreshed, go to sleep better, but the adverse is true as well. Overtiredness creates more overtiredness in terms of this like vicious snowball effect. 70% of most child sleep issues, I want you to know, is because of the root cause of lacking a proper routine because you're forcing unnatural rhythms onto a child. You don't want to just suddenly close the door on a child ever, but you don't want to try to tackle a child's sleeping patterns and figure out how you're gonna sleep train or what you're gonna do, what method, if you don't first confidently know what their internal clock wants, what their body naturally wants to do. Each child is their own unique universe and you wanna make sure you have things set up properly to figure out when the ideal times are for your baby's body 
So that way you can get this qualitative rolling cycle. A routine is the key to doing that, okay? A routine is basically a preventative key to fighting over tiredness. You might think that you already have a great routine set in place and that's great, but it's possible that when you've tried getting your child to sleep, you've been doing it at the wrong times and maybe your child is simply overtired, okay? When he's overtired, he's gonna fight it more and you don't want that to happen. Overtired can mean a few things. It can mean not getting enough sleep, it can mean sleeping enough, but not having it at the right time. So keep in mind that your baby, your child could be suffering from one or many of these things. And aside from battling overtiredness, a routine enables you as the parent to predict your child's needs before they come. It lessens your child's irritability drastically. You know, little baby doesn't have to cry because he's exhausted, because he's overtired, or he's ridiculously hungry, because you're able to fill his, his needs with confidence as they come. You don't have to play guessing games. Is my baby hungry? Is my baby overstimulated? Does my baby need to go back to sleep? Like, what's going on? Because you have an outline of his days, and you're simply able to flow with that instead of allowing exhaustion or irritability to set in. You prevent this before it even happens. Now, if you are a non-structured, free spirit kind of person, and you get nervous when I say routine and you want to run away, don't think of a routine being enslaved to the clock minute per minute. You know, we're not child drill sergeants here. It's not having a rigid, confining play-by-play, -play, but a routine is really the opposite. It's liberating, okay? It's just a sequence of events, a general flow to your day. My baby usually eats at this time, is normally happy within these hours, tends to get tired around that hour. You know, your baby's not a robot. We don't want him to be. But your daily routine should typically range to have a half hour of normalcy just so you can have that predictability. And all of us function like this. As adults, we are creatures of habit, okay? Much, most of us get hungry for lunch around the same time every day, get tired to go to bed. We might not go to bed, but our bodies want to, you know, wake up within a certain hour. Babies are miniature people, and we all thrive on some level of predictability. So that's just the framework of what a routine means and why it is so critical to implement before even working on teaching how your baby's gonna sleep. Having a routine helps you confidently help your kids, okay? It's fundamental, it's a key baseline to ensuring your child sleeps well so you can work with his natural rhythms of what his body wants to do. Remember, routine is not what you think he needs to do. It's really following his cues and seeing what his body wants. So that is what a routine is. Now let's talk about this foundation. Foundation of actually preempting sleep is equally as important as the actual routine you have set up. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. A routine is basically only as good as how it's introduced. What do I mean by that? How you wind your child down to sleep, gets his body in gear, helps him consciously, subconsciously be aware that sleep is coming. You know, once your baby approaches his ideal time that you've designated for sleep, we're going to talk about a few key ideas right now to help transition him into a calmer state before he actually falls asleep. So all children, whether we're talking here about a new two-year-old, a two-month-old, a 10-year-old, all children have ideal times to go to sleep. We just discussed, you know, getting a solid routine in place, but it's when their body's in this optimal place to go to sleep. It doesn't mean your baby's going to magically drift off, but it means that it's in this opportune time to encourage sleep. At this time, what's happening is that hormones are being produced throughout your baby's body. And he's basically in this relaxed state, in his prime sleep state to go to sleep. But what happens if you miss this moment, you miss this opportune moment, and you wait too long to put your baby to sleep? Now, logically, you would think these hormones just continue being, you know, distributed so abundantly that little baby gets tired and conks out on the floor. But all of you have kids here, and you know that is not what happens, right? The opposite is true. Your baby gets overtired, inconsolable, fights sleep even more, and you might think of it as a second wind, but really it's just your baby showing signs of distress and needing to go to sleep even more. So that's why it is so critical to catch your baby when he is ready, when he's in this opportune place, and not wait too long. Waiting too long is just setting him up to fight sleep more, okay? So let's work with his body when he naturally wants to go to sleep. Practically speaking, what can you do? What can you do to catch this opportune place? So really the most important thing because you want to follow your baby's natural instincts is just keep your eyes on your baby i strongly suggest logging your baby's habits for a few days being in tune with his needs you'll see you know every day at 9 a.m your baby's rubbing his eyes and already getting tired so why wait till 9 30 if you see consistently this is what's happening with his body as this time approaches you want to catch your baby at this opportune time to get him to sleep and if he's already crying already protesting already fidgety pulling his ears Honestly, the likelihood is that you've missed that window and waited too long. So get him to sleep and get him to sleep fast. The goal is to get your baby asleep by his ideal time so you can work naturally. And it doesn't always work with timing. It's not like 9 a.m. every day. 
or 10 p.m. Sometimes it's a sequence of how long your baby's been awake. Some babies, can, their ideal time is two hours of awake time. Some babies, it's three hours. Some babies, it's an hour and a half. Depends on his development, depends on age, so many things. But you want to properly do that, okay? That's number one, keep your eyes on your baby. Number two is properly wind your baby down to sleep by preempting sleep. The closer you get to this window, basically the more dangerous territory you're entering because this window is super, super sensitive. So if your goal, let's say, is to have your baby asleep by 7 p.m., okay, then at 6.45, 10, 15 minutes before this ideal place, start getting your baby into a less stimulated atmosphere to encourage relaxation. Take your baby out of the busy, light, stimulating place and into another room. You can change his diaper, hold him, cuddle him, start quietly singing. You know, as long as it's calm, doing this will help your baby transition into relaxation mode before crankiness sets in. You know, none of us would go on a five mile run and jump into our bed. Some of us would not go on a five mile run at all. But we wouldn't just run around exercising, hop into our beds and expect our bodies to naturally be sleepy. You know, babies also need ample time to go from point A to point B and get in this relaxation mode before sleep. And this is where we go wrong, okay? Some babies can transition easily, okay? You could take them out of the crib and into the crib and play with them and put them back to sleep. But a lot of babies really need more time and they have a difficult time going from fun peekaboo with mommy to quiet, dark room with expectations for sleep. So realize that although getting your baby to sleep at this ideal time is critical, it's not the only factor. It's coupled with making sure that you give him time to help his body wind down for sleep. You know, when one of my daughters was two years old, we had a really solid routine set up before she even went to sleep. I remember we'd go into her room, turn off the lights, close the shades. She'd put her head on my shoulder. I'd sing her a lullaby, 30 seconds, two minutes if she was lucky. You know, I'd place her in the crib and leave. If I had a little bit more time, maybe I'd sing longer, but the whole process basically never took longer than a few minutes because we did this every single time before she went to sleep for a nap, for bedtime since birth. And she knew exactly when we went into her room, she put her head on my shoulder, she'd go to sleep. She didn't think we were gonna go eat lunch. We were playing with siblings. She knew sleep was coming because she associated these cues with sleep. And because we've done it the same thing for all of her naps, all of that time, she didn't question what was happening. So this concept is so your baby can learn to follow these predictable cues and no sleep is coming. So what practical ideas can you do to kind of promote this pre-ritual and optimize it? Number one, like I said, do calming activities, soft singing, a dark room, baby massages, baths, whatever you like. But if your baby's eyes don't suddenly droop when you're doing this wind down process, it's okay. He's still getting the message. Repeat it over and over and over and over and over, and your baby will internalize it, okay? Next is the when, but not the how. What do I mean by this, okay? With your baby's routine, it's never gonna be precise or exact. It shouldn't be, right? These are not machines, okay? But you will be pleasantly surprised that after a short amount of time incorporating consistency, you'll see that a majority of your child's sleep budding will really drastically have minimized, okay? So the next logical question is, okay, but yeah, I get it, routine, routine, routine. But how do I establish a routine, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about now. There is a myriad of problems that you might be having right now. You might feel like your baby's sleep is totally erratic. There's no consistency. You might feel like every time you finally are successful at getting your baby to sleep, you put them down and the whole merry-go-round starts again. It might fight bedtime. You might wake frequently throughout the night, early rising. We're going to ask questions at the end and you'll tell me all your stories. But whatever it is, we're not going to focus yet at all about how a baby sleeps until we confidently know when his body needs to be sleeping. That's why we're calling it the when, not the how. And I say yet, because we're gonna get the how soon, okay? So whether or not you have an infant, a toddler, we're just gonna discuss establishing this routine and the when of sleep. So what does this mean? The when is the routine. When you are incorporating the when, when you are incorporating your routine, do your best to help your baby sleep, no matter what it takes, okay? If your baby needs to be held to sleep, fine. If your baby needs to be rocked in the stroller, no problem. If you need to sit with your toddler and tell him stories for an hour at bedtime for him to go to sleep, I don't care. First, just focus on his body following these rhythms and getting used to sleeping at these times we're introducing. Because once we're confident we know what his body needs, then we can move on to the next step. So your short-term goal should be that when you know this opportune time for sleep, this when, this routine you have incorporated is happening, make sure you do everything possible to get your child to sleep and make sure sleep happens. Holds especially true for younger babies. The goal here is to have your baby asleep at the times you've designated and make sure that you can do anything possible to help. And even with an older baby or a toddler, you want to establish this foundation so their body can get in gear, follow these cues, and know that sleep is coming. Okay? So in this next step, we're going to talk about the how and everything like that. But 
it's, it's absolutely the foundation. I cannot talk about routine enough. I don't want to bore you, but I could talk about routine right now for another three hours, but <laughs> this is the rundown. It is so critical and it's honestly the missing step where parents go wrong. You got to get this set up properly and work with your baby's body in the natural rhythms before ever moving forward. Okay. So let me ask you a question. We're going to do a little activity. How many of you feel like you have a solid routine, routine set up? You write it down here in the chat box. Let me know. What do you feel most confident with? We'll say that. You can either tell me you have, feel like you have a routine or do you feel confident with your baby's naps? Do you feel confident with bedtime? What do you feel like is the most set part of your routine or what part of the routine do you feel like you are struggling with the most? I'm going to give you a few minutes. Let me know. That way we can talk about it a little bit more at the end and you can let me know in the chat box. Okay, someone got some credit about the baby up at 5.30. We're going to talk all about this, but it's the timing. Waking up at night is consistent. Okay, there you go. I had a routine till last, till Leah, so now I'm waking up. Okay, good routine. Your baby's rocks to sleep, but wait, so I'm put in the crib. Okay, getting your baby to stay asleep all night. Very good at sleeping during the day. This goes very fast. Wakes up a lot at night. Routine, rocking babies have a good nighttime routine, but not naps. You're confident with baby's first nap. Naps are impossible. Okay, we're all over the place here. Let's see. Your five-year-old is worried. He has a worrier, so he can't fall asleep. Cat napping. Oh, good question here. When do you introduce your routine? You can really start from day one. Obviously, like a newborn, you can't wake up so easily, but you can start from day one enlisting a routine and incorporating it. And the older your baby gets and the longer your baby's able to stay awake as they grow older, you can continue moving forward with that. So, you know, even a baby that's a few weeks old doesn't have to be, you know, black and white with when naps are and how long, but you can start getting a wake time figured out. You can start figuring out how often you feed your baby and just setting a solid baseline for everything like that. You're most confident with nap times, waking up. Okay, so you're basically, all of you have something you're confident with. Even if it's what you said, you're confident your baby will wake up. That's still something to work on. You know, it's something to start with. So it's really important that you can set this up. And I really recommend writing notes, like I said, logging things for a few days to try to figure out when this sweet spot for sleep is, when this opportune window is for your baby, for your child, whether it's bedtime, a nap, everything, because that's what's going to help get your baby's sleep in an awesome place, prevent overtiredness, and get into a really positive, positive cycle, okay? So let's just summarize what we talked about right now. A solid sleep routine is the foundation for teaching your baby how to sleep or your child how to sleep. Otherwise, you are just solving symptoms of the problem instead of getting to the root of them. It is in big red flashing lights. If you can leave the webinar with the most important concept, it's this. Don't try to teach your baby how to sleep until you know when they need to be sleeping, really, okay? This is absolute key. Now, let me tell you a little story. This is cute Emma who was seven months old when her mother contacted me. She had no structure to her days. Her mom had tried everything and Emma was unhappy and she cried a lot. We logged her habits, we created an ideal routine for her, we figured out the when, right? You know what the when is and we built upon that. She needed two more naps than she was getting and this poor little girl couldn't stay awake as long as her mother thought. So, you know, you wanna make sure you're working with your baby's natural rhythms before moving forward with his sleep, okay? So we talked about routine. Now we're going to get to the second step here of independent sleeping, all right? We're going to talk about getting to the root, figuring out now you know when your baby is sleeping, and now you're so confident with his sleep needs and his intra rhythms, but why is baby still not sleeping well, okay? So let's talk about this. First of all, why is your baby still waking up, right? You might be asking yourself, okay, but yeah, that's great. I have a routine set up. I understand the logic, but I still have to teach my kid how to sleep. This baseline's great, but what do I do next, okay? So let's talk about the science of sleep. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about how sleep works and what is baby, waking your baby up to begin with, okay? Babies have various sleep cycles and rhythms just like adults do. REM, non-REM, deeper sleeps, lighter sleeps. It very dramatically affects not only how your baby sleeps, but obviously how he wakes up, which is the problem while you're here. You're not here because your baby's sleeping. You're here because your baby's waking up. That's the problem, okay? So this is what's happening. Your baby has something called a sleep cycle. And during the day, sleep cycles are usually 30 to 50 minutes, depending on your child's age. But at night, the sleep cycles become longer and they become deeper. So let's say for the sleep cycle, baby falls to sleep in scenario one, being rocked to sleep in mommy's arms, okay? Baby falls into a deep sleep, it's great. And as this 30 to 50 minute mark slowly approaches, baby begins to complete his first sleep cycle, right? Sleep cycle is ending at this 30, 50 minute mark. 
As soon as he about to transition to his next sleep cycle, he experiences something called a partial awakening. All right, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's basically when your baby becomes partially awake, semi-aware of his surroundings, you know, he checks out his environment, <clears throat> makes sure he's still safe, sees the same cues and falls back to sleep. By the way, you and I do this as well. We might fluff up our pillows, rearrange our covers, do something else in our half sleep state. Okay, so what's going on here? Your baby's not going back to sleep, right? Your baby's not having this partial awakening, following the cues and going back to sleep. Your baby is screaming all night. So what's going on? Why can't your baby transition from sleep cycle one to sleep cycle two? So think about it this way. Baby fell asleep in mother's arms, the scenario we just talked about. And after baby was asleep, mommy put him down in the crib because your arms hurt. You were holding a 10 month old baby that weighs 20 pounds and you can't hold him all night. I get it, all right? So you put him down in his crib. He begins to have this partial awakening as his sleep cycle is ending. He's semi-aware of his surroundings. He begins checking out his environment, expects to see that he's safe. He's still in mommy's arms, but oh no, he suddenly realizes, wait a minute, I'm not in mommy's arms. I'm in this cold crib all by myself. What is going on? Please give me that first scenario back. Hold me again. Press me up against your warm body. I don't want to be here by myself. I, I need you to fall back asleep. So baby is now completely awake. What started as a normal partial awakening has turned into a full-blown protesting spell. Baby now woke up and basically needs you to recreate his original sleep environment in order to fall back asleep. That's why he wakes up throughout the night. That's why he can't take long naps. He needs you to constantly help him recreate his original sleep environment. Okay, I'm sure you don't need me to get into more detail of what it looks like. You're popping the Pepsi in all night. You're nursing all night. You're giving bottles. You might be driving around the car, rocking, bouncing, helping, holding, shaking, everything, okay? So the goal is to teach your baby to fall asleep in this exact same scenario he's going to be having these partial awakenings in. So that way, he can independently transition from sleep cycle to sleep cycle. He can fall asleep in one place, complete a sleep cycle, have his partial awakening in the same place, and transition back to sleep all well in the same place, right? It makes so much sense. I was recently working with a mother who said exactly that. Oh, yeah, it makes so much sense. I guess that, you know, I get it because I wouldn't be so happy if I fell asleep in my big comfortable bed and then woke up and I was on my kitchen floor. <laughs> okay, it's funny, but it's how your kids feel. They're falling asleep, being nursed, being held, being rocked, being cuddled, it's delicious, and then suddenly like, whoa, jolter, where am I, all right? So most children suffer from this inability to transition from sleep cycle to sleep cycle, it is common. And what they are dependent on in order to fall asleep is, dun, 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 a sleep dependency. Okay, I'm sure you've heard this word before, but what is it? A sleep dependency could betray itself in many, many ways, all right? Your baby may continuously need his pacifier. You might need to nurse every hour, only falls asleep being held, being wrapped in the stroller. I'm sure you can make your own list, okay? But these dependencies steal your sleep because you are the one who's feeding your baby. You are the one who's popping the pacifier, and you're the one doing this whole song and dance. It's a real issue for everyone. So first of all, don't worry. Many parents fall into this trap because they can't do anything else to help their baby sleep, and you're tired, it's understandable, out of pure desperation and exhaustion, you do whatever you can, but it becomes a problem, and things can really skyrocket out of control. The baby is crying, you want to rock it. He's still crying until you nurse him. Then you bring him into your bed, and then you do whatever you can. And I know how tempting it can be, it's a quick fix, but that's where these sleep dependencies get really, really entrenched. When you have a baby waking up every hour to eat, or a toddler that needs you to constantly lay in bed with him, and you don't want to. Now, if you want to, that's fine. I always tell people, parents, when they contact me, that something is only an issue if you feel it is. So if you're happy nursing your baby all night and you want to co-sleep, great. But if you're not happy about your situation, it's a sleep dependency. Because something that is not okay is to let a situation make us resentful, make us unhappy towards our children, because then we have to change our emotions or fix the problem, okay? So your child is basically dependent on something or someone to always help him transition back to sleep over and over and over and over. You know, a mother called me recently who had a 15 month old who was a big big guy okay and he only fell asleep when mommy held him standing up in a non-stationary position what do i mean holding up and standing him and rocking holding him and standing him and doing lunges like she had like one of those big exercise balls but she would like bounce up and down up and down she couldn't stay in one place she'd eventually put him down pray to the dear lord he'd stay asleep half the time he would half the time he wouldn't you know start the whole merry ground again it was exhausting so we're going to talk right now about how to tackle this sleep dependency, but I wanted you to just very vividly understand what it is and why it is happening. So the big question that all of you were probably excited to hear about now, 
is how are you going to teach your baby to sleep without leaving him to cry, right? Everyone thinks that babies have to cry. They have to be, you know, left alone for hours on end. So the big question is to cry or not to cry, all right? So let's first talk about all the alternate sleep solutions that exist today, and I'm going to tell you why I don't like them, and then I'll tell you what I do recommend, okay? So first of all, the most widespread idea is something called cry it out. I'm sure all of you have heard of it. To most, this means putting your baby in his crib, putting your toddler in his room or his bed, and leaving him to scream by himself. The goal is that he eventually learns to settle him sleep because there's no sleep dependencies, right? He falls asleep by himself, he has partial awakenings by himself, and he goes back to sleep by himself. So theoretically, yeah, I guess it could work, but many parents, myself included, shudder at this idea of leaving a child to scream. You know, if you've done it, I, or don't have a problem with it, that's great, but that's why I started this to begin with, because I personally didn't want to do that, okay? There's no judgments here. I'm never here to tell someone they're right, they're wrong, but I'm just giving a technical rundown of the different ideas. So that's the first way. Some kids doing cry it out are fine with it. They respond beautifully, and they learn to sleep through the night, but other kids have really drastically negative responses. You know, some kids might learn to sleep three nights, great, while another might really feel traumatized, might really feel alone, might sleep more, never learn how to sleep well, and that's why I'm not such a huge fan of this method, because there's no blanket statement that says, all personalities will mold to cry it out. You know, our babies are unique, <laughs> they're independent people, so even though, yeah, it might have worked for one of your friends, that doesn't mean it's going to work for your baby, and even more so, that you're comfortable with it, okay? So let's talk about another method, the absolute opposite extreme. Methods that claim there's zero crying whatsoever, okay? So night number one, you hold your baby till he's asleep completely and put him down. Great. Night number two, you hold your baby till he's drowsy and falling asleep. Put him down. Number three, night number three, you know, you place him down in his crib awake. And if he cries, God forbid, for a second, you pick him back up again. And then you put him back down. And then you pick him back up again. And you put him back down. And where does this get you? totally absolutely nowhere okay i have yet to find a completely absolute no cry whatsoever method that does work because in this scenario the baby still has a sleep dependency he's still being held to sleep and parents usually burn out doing picking up and putting down and picking up and putting down and even more than that your baby gets mixed messages wait a minute sometimes i'm protesting and you ignore me sometimes i'm protesting and you respond to me like they don't know what's up or down okay so that's picking up the putting down the responding immediately type i have trust me another method i'm going to tell you about but this specific method i don't like let's talk about a checking system an in-between method okay what is normally known as the ferber method ferberizing okay what is this basically when you leave your baby at progressively longer intervals so he learns how to sleep but still has reassurance so you put him in his crib let's say and leave him to cry for three minutes then you go out after three minutes, come back in, give him a kiss. Then go back out, leave him for five minutes. Then after five minutes, go back in, and 10 minutes, you go back out. And every minute, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, you go back in and give him a kiss. There's like a cap at each night. So what, does it work? It can, but the problem is the child is still left to scream alone for sometimes 20 to 30 minutes when you start, how it works is you, you know, like you, the intervals get longer and longer. So you do three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, then five minutes, 10 minutes, 20, but it could get anywhere to 20, 30, 40 minutes of a kid screaming by themselves and you don't want to do that. So an even bigger problem I have with that is like, again, they're getting totally overstimulated. They're not learning what's up, what's right, what's wrong, what's down, and it just doesn't work. Many parents call me who have tried all of these methods and they don't see success. As parents, we always want to instill trust within our kids. It all boils down to ensuring that they feel emotionally secure. And honestly, all kids are gonna respond differently based on their temperament. So what do I recommend, okay? The goal is to take your child's temperament your personality, what works for you into account. So you shouldn't ever feel like you're compromising your own beliefs or doing something that you think won't work for your kid or you're not interested in doing. So I have created something called the gentle phase out method. It's kind of a middle ground solution, okay? And that's what I use with all the families I work with and help. It's basically slowly, progressively phasing you out of the picture. You can mold it to any age or any situation. So let's say in the beginning, you might help your baby a lot. Every time they protest, get upset, you rub their back, you talk to them, you pet them, you kiss them. And every few nights, you lessen the amount of interaction you're using to help them. You slowly move further away. Sometimes it's talking less, sometimes it's touching less. The ultimate goal is that your child you know, learns to fall asleep on their own, but the beauty is they get consistent messages from you. And they feel safe knowing that you're there and knowing that you are always responding to them. And you slowly help acclimate them to learning how to self-soothe without having such strong sleep dependency, but also without leaving them to scream. Let me give you an example, okay? I have someone that I'm just finishing up with now, okay? Chloe, have her permission to use her name. Okay, Chloe has a one and a half year old daughter named Abby. Abby, when we started, always wanted to sleep 
with her mom, okay? Either in her mom's bed, with her mom on the floor, in mom's bed. You know, her sleep dependency was obvious. She needed to be pressed up against her mommy's body, holding her mom's hand, stroking her hair. She'd typically wake up, you know, one to three times at night. Mom would have to repeat the process, lay with her, and around 2 a.m., mom would just give up and bring her into her own bed. It was not an ideal situation. Mom was really tired. Abby was tired. The, their marriage was suffering a lot because mom was always busy with the baby, could never spend time with her husband. It was a little bit sticky. So first, what did we do? We first had to ensure Abby was sleeping at the time she needed in that whole routine step, okay? After filling in my documents that I send, we saw that really we needed to make her nap a lot earlier. She wasn't falling asleep at bedtime well because things were distributed great. Fine. Got the naps and bedtime in gear. Once we did that, we started moving on to Abby's sleep dependency. We slowly, gradually, never pushing her too quickly, but slowly and gradually taught her how to fall asleep without needing to always lie down with mom. So how did we do this? At first, we transitioned Abby to going to sleep well in her bed, but with all of mom's, mom's help, okay? So first, we knew she was tired. She was in this optimal place for sleep because we had worked on that. So what we did, uh, instead of Abby laying in mom's bed with her, Chloe, the mother, would go and sit in a chair right next to Abby's bed and hold Abby's hand, stroke Abby's hair, sing to her. Abby got a little frustrated because she wants to sleep in mom's bed, but mom was right there. She wasn't abandoned, she wasn't traumatized, she wasn't alone, nothing, because every time Abby got upset, Chloe, the mother, would just sing to her and touch her and hold her hand, and she didn't budge. And she, eventually, Abby learned to feel confident and know that her mother was there every time she needed her. So for the first few nights, we did only this. Abby, anytime Abby woke up, Chloe would go into the room, sit back in the chair, sing to her, stroke her head, after four nights of doing this, Abby was okay with not sleeping in mom's bed, which was amazing progress. So what we did after four or five nights was we moved to the next step. We started getting Abby used to winding down in her own bed without mom involved as much. So on night number five, Chloe scooted her chair a little bit further away from Abby's bed. She still sat there singing, calming her. Abby, again, she protested, but she saw that mom was right there. She was confident that no one was playing sneak away games or she wasn't gonna run away. She stayed there till she was sleeping. And she would sit there. So you kind of get the picture. Over the course of two weeks, Chloe lessened the amount of interventions. She scooted her chair out. She touched her less. She talked to her less, kind of phasing her out of the picture more and more. While Abby could still feel totally secure, knowing that her mom was there and knowing that her mother was responding to her. So we're actually in the strong stretch now. Abby last night slept nine hours straight. Woohoo! We're very excited. But I use this philosophy whether I'm working with a two-month-old a two-year-old, we just mold it to each family's circumstance, the child's needs, but we always do it slowly and gradually, phasing the parents out slowly to ensure results, but that's why it's called the gentle phase out method, okay? Now, obviously, it's much more detailed in every situation, and I spend two, three weeks alone with each family doing this, but I hope you get the idea and understand how critical it is to never push your child too quickly and use a gentler approach because we want to work from the ground up and do everything as slow, as slow as possible. Okay, I see a few people ask questions. We're going to get to that in a second, okay? But you always want to make your child feel secure by doing this. So let me ask you, before we talk about solutions, let's talk about what your children's sleep dependencies are. Give me a list here. What do you feel like your baby, your child's sleep dependency is? Is it pacifier? Is it rocking? Is it holding? Is it shaking? Is it driving around the car at midnight? Whatever it is. Pacifier, boxing, cold sleeping bottle, walking around with her, nursing on me, nursing... Nursing or bucking, pacifier, nursing, a lot of nursing, driving, holding. <laughs> okay, nursing, nursing, nursing. There you go. Okay, we've had them all here. Nursing, another nursing. Okay, it's delicious, it's yummy. You do it maybe because it's convenient, but if you don't want to be doing it, then it's definitely a sleep dependency. Bottles. You don't even know you're so confused with what your sleep dependency is. Okay, something on my hand, on her face. Okay, there's a lot of sleep dependencies. I'm gonna ask your, answer your question about how to phase out a little more, but basically, depending on your situation, use this idea of phasing yourself out progressively by starting by putting your child in their crib with as much of your help as possible or your toddler in their sleeping space and really get them really comfortable where you want them sleeping. And then once that's set, make a game plan to slowly phase yourself out. That can mean something so different for each child and each family, but make a game plan of how you're gonna ultimately get to your goal of not being as involved by slowly, slowly, slowly phasing yourself out of the picture. Okay, so let's summarize this step here. The absolute key to teaching your baby to know how to sleep is by tackling his what? His sleep dependency. But you also want to take into his unique personality, your parenting philosophy, very, very, very critical, okay? So let me tell you about this cute guy here, Gavin. 
Gavin was three years old. He's four now. We worked together last year. And he refused to stay in his bed at night. His parents had to coax him in his bed literally for hours to settle him down. And his parents felt like the three-year-old was running the show, okay? His sleep dependency was that mom had to sit with him for an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two, rubbing his back. If she tried to sneak away, it was all over, okay? So what we did was we created a gentle method, similar to what I said with Abby, slowly getting him acclimated to feed, you know, falling asleep with less and less of her help. But he also had to learn how to calm his body down. Gavin would get so overtired, he would fight, 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 sleep more and more. So we made him feel like a million dollars in the process with charts, and we actually had to physically teach him how to allow relaxation to calm because he fought it so much. But in five weeks, he was actually asked him to go to bed, which was pretty, pretty amazing and very exciting. So that's the second step of independent sleep. When we talked about routine, we talked about independent sleeping. Let's talk about the sleep line. And like I told you, it's future problems, future issues, what to do and how to ensure that your child continues sleeping like a champ for years to come when setbacks happen, when hurdles come. Okay, so there's more questions here, but we're gonna get to them soon, okay? When all these different things happen. So let's just talk about what the sleep line is, okay? You might be thinking what I'm saying sounds great, okay? But once you spend time teaching your child to sleep, what to do in the future? You know, many times stumbling blocks occur down the road. You might work on your child's sleep now, have something else arrive, a new baby comes, you travel, get sick, grandma visits, everything. I will tell you as a seasoned mother, but I'm sure you know too, that the absolute only constant thing we can ever rely on is that our kids are always changing, <laughs> okay? It's true, they are always changing. So the, view, the goal is to view sleep as a line, like this road here. You might veer a little to the right of it sometimes, a little bit to the left. It's never going to be perfect because life is never perfect. It's throwing us off. But, you know, the goal is that you should get back to your sleep line of good sleep habits as much as possible. So that way you don't deviate too far from your, your line otherwise. Because life's challenges are always going to be jumping back and forth with your sleep. But if you stay a little to the right, a little to the left, but don't get too off center, then you'll be fine. Let's talk about an example of this, like when your child gets sick, okay, let's say baby sleeps great, and he gets sick, and suddenly a baby that used to be sleeping through the night is now waking up every two hours for bottles, okay? What happened here? He went off his sleep line. What do you do? Obviously, when a baby gets sick, you give him as much TLC as he needs, all the emotional, physical support, hugging him, kissing him, holding him, but right when he's better, you want to get right back to your old habits of what you did, because I will tell you that new habits can take shape much quicker than old ones can be forgotten, okay? So it's really, really important. And that's what the sleep line is, not veering too far from it, while making sure you give your child their needs when the obstacles arise, or traveling, jet lag, you know, you go to a new time zone, whatever it is. It's really difficult, but it's the same rule that applies when you sit. You have to roll with the punches with life while you're away, deal with what you can, when you get, but when you get back home, get back onto that sleep force, okay? When you're traveling, try your best to maintain normalcy, not revert back to the old habits when your baby was sleeping, but understand that right when you get back home, you want to go back to his regular habits of not having 100 bottles in the night, and the regular bedtime, and the lavender oil, and the baths, and all your routines before you do before bed to get him back in, because the longer you wait to get back into your sleep line, the harder it is, okay? So, just enjoy life, but understand that things happen and there are always challenges arising. So tell me five sleep obstacles that you can think of that would get you off of your sleep line or tell me one because between all of you, we'll have a lot. Let's see. Teething. That's a good one. Your baby always has an ear infection and you have to train her when she doesn't feel well. Oh, that's horrible. Now a baby that's sick, obviously you always want to make sure that you give your baby whatever she needs. But if they're having constant ear infections, that could definitely cause that. You know, obviously go to the doctor and make sure your baby's okay. There's not liquid in his ears. But when a baby's not feeling well, you can't teach them to have good sleep habits. But the goal is that when they're well, they have a solid, solid foundation so that when they're sick or not feeling well, they're just slightly thrown off and get back on. Let's see. Teething, going away, going away for the weekend, needs a pacifier and wakes up in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's a common thing, but that's not the sleep line. Teething, growth spurts, developmental leap, yes, yes, and yes. Sleeping in a new place, siblings, oh yeah, that's a good one. I'm actually going to talk to you about that in a minute, but yeah, weddings, everything and anything that can throw off our normal life that we do it. Two-year-olds in the same room, siblings, a lot of people around when you normally have a quiet house, totally. These are perfect, perfect examples. So let's summarize the sleep line, okay? In order to prevent sleep regressions in the future, 
you need a solid sleep line in place. That way you never veer too far off track with your baby's sleep. Now I just told you, I recently worked with these cute siblings, Anna and her baby brother, Donnie. Okay, so let's talk about what happened. Both slept great independently when they were each in their own rooms. Mom tried to get them in the same room and everything went totally haywire, okay? They were waking each other up, they were playing. It was basically like a disaster jam pajama party you don't wanna go to. So first we had to get them both back into their own individual sleep lines take some steps back. Mom had to reteach them on their own while keeping them together, laying down the rules with their sleep and then help acclimate them to each other's noises so they can become less sensitive to this new shared environment. It took some time, but when a baby is used to sleeping in his own room in silence and suddenly baby brother is coughing and rolling around, it takes some time to adjust, but it's a learning process. Nothing's ever immediate or too fast, okay? So those are the main three steps we talked about here. We talked about Routine, the foundations of sleep, where to start and how to start by ensuring you're working with your child's natural rhythms and you have a solid sleep line, baseline, excuse me, set up so you know when your baby needs to be sleeping. Then once you have that, you can move on to independent sleeping, getting to the root. We talked about sleep dependencies, why your child's waking up with sleep associations and sleep cycles, and how you can gradually phase yourself out of the picture without using intense crying methods or things that aren't gonna work. Then we talked about the sleep line just now, life's beautiful changes that throw us off, okay, and how to navigate them to make sure we're not suddenly constantly always teaching our child to sleep every two weeks when we go away for the night or when we go to a wedding or when we travel or when someone gets sick or all the hundreds of things that can happen, okay? We want to make sure that we can always do whatever we can to stay on target with everything. So I'm really happy you came here and you learned a lot of valuable information with all of this. But there are some people today who are going to take this information and make changes in the home right away. But I have to be honest here, this really was an overview. I hit my slide thing a minute too early. I'll show you in a second what that was. I did my best to pack as much information as we could here in this short little hour together. But like I told you, and you know, each child is his own unique universe, requires a, his own individual plan. I really want to help you see changes in your home. And I want you to get the recipe because I've been there, right? I've told you my story. I know how hard it is. And I'm still a busy mom myself. I have a lot of kids. And honestly, when I don't sleep, I am not the person I want to be, okay? I'm impatient, I don't have time for anyone, including myself, and it's not pretty. So it's basically just about making that decision for change, okay? That real decision, like I told you that night the Cheerios happened where I was like in my absolute low, I was like, this is it. My husband found me, passed out on the couch, the Cheerios all over the floor and stuck to the baby's face at 3 a.m., like that's a pretty low place. That's what changed my life, okay? But you have to decide if you wanna be the rested person. So the slide I accidentally showed you, but I'll show you now. This is these three steps, this is the three steps in much more detail. When we go through everything in more detail, we get to the root of it. We don't stick a bandaid on the problem, okay? These three steps go a lot deeper. Instead of just the foundation of sleep, we actually work on finding your baby's habits, implementing the first step of the routine, the second step of the routine, and getting a solid routine set up. Once we're there, we get to the root of your baby's sleep dependency and create a gentle phase on it that caters to your child, their sleep needs. We work on the night, then we finish them off in a good two weeks typically. And once that's there, we get even deeper with schedule changes, step back, turtles, spring forward, fall back, or it's hello daylight savings time. That happens twice a year and can throw us off. The sibling shuffle of navigating bedtime with a bunch of kids or co-sharing with rooms and everything like that, okay? And you have a choice now. You can continue and work on implementing all these amazing ideas we just talked about on your own, and you can definitely see where you get, because I really tried to pack as much as I could here, and there's a lot of information that you can use to really help you. But if you are fed up with your child's lack of sleep, and you really want change, this is what I want you to do, okay? Number one is first have a talk with yourself, okay? Am I serious about making changes in my life right now with my baby's sleep? Is this something I need to do for myself? Is this something I need to do for my sanity? You know, only you can make that decision, but the only way you can decide if you're ready to make changes is to really sit down with yourself or with a friend like I'm doing here <laughs> and sit and talk about problems and sit and figure out it's really something I need to do. Once you've done that and if you feel like this is for you and you're ready, click this link here, thoughtyouthebabycoach.com forward slash sleep. And what you're gonna do is fill in a form to set up a time to chat with me. And what we're gonna do if we decide to chat together is I'm gonna give you a rundown of my sleep services and how I can help you. As of now, I have two main services I offer if you wanna work directly with me and get my personal guidance. With both of these services, I basically walk you through these three steps we discussed start to finish. I make a tailored game plan for you and your family. And I guarantee results because trust me, I can help you to reach all of your sleep goals. I never let someone leave if they're not in a good situation. 
And I just want to be honest here, okay? Both of my sleep services, though, both of them that I'm talking about, just to lay it out on the table, I'm never here to play games. They're investments. They're investments financially, but it's an investment of your time as well. But if you're committed to taking action and getting your life back now, let's hop on a call together, okay? I can walk you through my whole process, how my programs can help you, and I promise you, okay? I've been doing this for 10 years. Whatever challenge you are having with your child, I've seen it before, and I can help you overcome it, okay? But, big, big but. Here is the catch. This is absolutely not for everyone, okay? So let's talk about what kind of parents this is for. Parents who know it's possible, okay? You know your child can sleep, but you just don't know how to do it, you know? A lot of people feel like there's absolutely no possibility. There's no way this is gonna happen. Could be you're right, probably not, because most children's sleep issues can be helped, assuming, you know, they're gaining weight healthily and they're in a good place, but knowing that it's possible. Number two is ready for change and ready for sleep. You know, you want to be rested. You want to be happy. You want to be a thriving parent, and you're at that place where you're just ready to do it. The third question is kind of funny. I didn't know how else to word it. Are you coachable? <laughs> okay, what does that mean? Basically, someone who can take my expert advice and implement it with my guidance. You know, my methods are gentle, but there's no magic tricks. We don't see something after two nights. It typically takes about two weeks until we fix your issues here, and you have to know that going into it. So are you the type of person who can be patient? who can follow through with instructions and be ready for that change. And number four, is this important to you? Okay, are you ready to invest in changing your life? Is this important enough to you? And no one can make that decision but you. You know, so if you do want, you feel like you meet this criteria of one, two, three, and four, go to this link. You'll be able to fill in a form to talk to me and we'll set up a time to chat and I will tell you about my services. So what you get at the end is, Oh, look at this gorgeous family. Hey, happy, well-rested family, okay? I want to just tell you one last story before we move on to question and answer. I just got this letter from Debbie in San Diego. It's a little long, but I'm going to read it to you, okay? It really hits home with me because what she wrote resonated with me so deeply. I'm sure it will with you, too. I'm going to take a drink of water, and then I'm going to read it. Hang on. Okay. Hi, Batya. When I first contacted you, I really felt like my life was on edge. Yes, I love my baby. Yes, I love my husband. But I really felt like I was falling apart. After nine months of sleep deprivation, I felt like my body couldn't take it anymore. I drank way too much coffee, ate too much chocolate, and gained a lot of weight back. But that didn't matter. What mattered was the fact that I was ashamed because I was bitter and resentful with my baby, Gwen. It wasn't her fault she was up all night, but I couldn't help but blame her. My sister had a baby that slept through the night on her own. Why wasn't mine? I napped at every opportunity during the day, but little 20-minute cat naps didn't compensate for my lost night sleep. I was really suffering. I felt distant from my husband because he, because he tried to help but couldn't nurse Gwen. Only I could, and it was the only thing that calmed her down. I didn't know how I'd get over this, and I didn't know how it would work, and I didn't want to leave her to cry it out. After working with you, though, and I worked with Debbie. I don't know if you're on here, Debbie. But after working with you, though, I feel like I've gained my entire life back. I have energy to take care of my baby, energy to spend time with my husband and friends, and I'm able to fill myself. I feel alive almost a year of living in a haze. I can smile again without drinking wine, <laughs> and I feel like I love my baby more than ever because I enjoy her without feelings of mixed emotions and guilt. Thank you so much, Batya, for not just giving me back my sleep, but giving me back myself. I love when I get emails like that. Okay, so I just wanted to share that with you. But as you know, your sleep is only a venue to all aspects of your life of happiness, right? It affects your relationships. It affects your confidence. It affects your emotional stability and your hormones and your happiness, okay? When your baby isn't sleeping, you are not sleeping. And that's what separates the happy parents who are rested from the parents who let themselves to continue suffering. And I'm just laying it out on the table and telling you how it is, okay? So if you're ready to make serious changes in your home, let's talk, all right? Click this link, fill in a form, and talk to me. So before I take questions, I just want you to, one more thing to put out there, okay? Think about how much money you spend or have already spent on helping your baby sleep, okay? A lot of people tell me they work with a night nurse or a nanny. Seriously, it can add up over weeks and months. And when all said and done, the night nurse leave is, leaves, the nanny leaves, and your problem has not been solved. You're back to square one with your baby not sleeping with hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars down the tube, okay? Let's say natural sleep remedies. This is a big one. Parents try a lot of homeopathic sleep remedies like melatonin doses, lavender oils. I'm not going to get into that now. They're great, but they can't solve the sleep dependency, right? They can burn a hole in your wallet, though. One mother told me she spent almost $2,000 on well visits to her natural doctor, combined with all these, you know, sleep remedies that he made her, nothing works, okay? At the end of the day, your own sanity, your energy, your life, it's priceless, okay? Think about how different your life will be once you can function at your best, because you're getting the rest you need to have energy, be vibrant again, right? What's that worth to you? Okay, so let's take some questions. I want to hear from you, and I want to hear from what you know, you think about this, what your questions are. We talked about a lot of things, and I'm going to stop talking for a minute. Well, I'm still going to talk and answer your questions. Okay, let's see. 
what do you do if they are screaming for their sleep dependency, comfort, nursing, even though you are gently rubbing his back, talking to them? That is a great question. Okay, so as I said, there's various phases to this whole situation, right? So if you're doing it, Katie, in the beginning, honestly, you have to just kind of allow them to continue protesting. I know it's hard when your baby cries, and I know I said that this webinar is without leaving him to cry. That's without leaving him to cry. But your baby crying is the way he communicates. He, he can't say, mommy, listen, I hear that you're, you know, you're here with me rubbing my back. You're talking to me, but like, this is not cool. Can you please just nurse me again? Really, like what's going on here? So instead, what does he do? He cries. But there's a very, very, very big difference between the child crying because God forbid they are not being responded to. I would never tell you to leave the child to cry but versus a child crying because they're not being responded to the way they want. So when your child is crying or upset, understand they're just having a full-fledged baby, baby temper tantrum. And you just continue giving them their needs and loving them and kissing them and cuddling them, but not necessarily giving them what they think they want. Okay, does that make sense, Katie? Let's see, I have to scroll up here with the questions. Okay, that was Katie, okay. You just have to answer all our questions. Can we contact Dr. Yes, sorry, I forgot to say that. Yes, uh, there are a lot of questions here. If I can't answer all of your questions, you can definitely email me. My email is in all the emails you received from me, actually, but it's batya at batyathebabycoach.com. All the way to spell my name, B-A-T-Y-A at batyathebabycoach.com. If I don't have time to answer your questions, definitely reach out to me, and we'll talk about them via email. Okay, a lot of people are complaining about constantly needing a pacifier and nursing during the night. Yes, that's true. So it's the same thing that you're asking here. That's really, honestly, the most common sleep dependencies are pacifiers, bottles, and nursing. Those are the top three because they're the easiest and they're the quickest fixes. And honestly, it all stems from when they're newborns. You pop in the passy, it's easy, right? It's called a plug, right? Whatever it is. You nurse them because maybe it quiets them, maybe you're concerned about weight gain, or maybe you just want to bond with your delicious baby. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you're not okay with something, then that's when it becomes an issue. Better to start with naps or nighttime training. Oh, awesome question. Start with nighttime. Always, always, always start with nighttime because you have to keep those daytime sleeps intact to make sure that your child doesn't get overtired. So I'd always start with bedtime in the nights. And once you have that solidified, then move on to the daytime naps because it'll be a lot easier to work with it during the day when it's less foreign of a concept. Your baby isn't used to sleeping in a crib in a different room. What should you do? Okay, so you have to start making a game plan of what you feel comfortable with and what you want to start adjusting. What are your goals? You know, sit down with yourself and say, all right, I want my baby to be rested during the day and figure out the routine. And ideally, my ideal situation is that my baby sleeps in another room, but right now it works better for me when my baby's in my bed. Or, you know, what's your plan and how are you going to phase yourself out? That's what you have to do. I um, used to wake up at night by daytime. I'm just nurse to sleep. Hang on, the questions are fast. Okay. Yes, there will be a recording. I've been working with my foster baby. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Going up three hours in the bottom and still can't. Okay. So you want to do it slowly. It's all about incrementally slowly doing everything. Because if you try to push a baby's body too fast, it could just potentially go opposite. And it's difficult to teach a baby to sleep through the night when a baby is not totally acclimated to doing it. And that's why we do this. Now, Carol just asked a really good question. What to do basically with when you're trying to stretch out night feedings? All right, I want to say something and listen to this. It's really important. Habit and hunger are directly correlated. What do I mean? If a baby wakes up every three hours to nurse or to have a bottle, but even if they don't need to nurse or have a bottle, but their body has trained itself to eat that frequently, it's still considered hunger to me. If you and I would set an alarm at 3 a.m., every night, and I use this example all the time, we would wake up every night for a week at 3 a.m. and make ourselves a grilled cheese sandwich. Eventually, we would start waking up hungry every night at 3 a.m. So your baby's body has trained itself to wake up all this time and be hungry. So you want to do everything gradually. If your baby wakes up every two hours at night and is a you know, year-old baby and is gaining weight, doesn't need to wake up every two hours like a newborn, then for a few nights, as you're using this gentle phase-out method, start spacing out the night feedings. Go from two hours to two and a half hours to three hours to three and a half hours. You never want to do something too quickly because hunger is painful for a baby, and you don't ever want to put them in that position to be uncomfortable. Okay? Now, I'm just going to say some frequent questions people ask about my program and things like that, and then I'm going to have to sign off because my throat's starting to hurt. Okay? In terms of working with me, if you're interested in filling out a form, I work with all kinds of ages, but for my two programs to fill in the form, I work with babies five months and older. 
if you have a baby younger than five months, I have a bunch of different programs and courses and stuff I'm working on now. So reach out to me. But for this form alone, to be back in touch with me, I work one-on-one -on -one with babies five months and older, sometimes four, depending on their development. I can help you with twins. I can help you with multiples. I've worked even before with quads, quadruplets. Yes, crazy to imagine, but true. And it takes about two weeks or so, okay? And you want to be successful. You want to be motivated. And you have to be the type of person to stick with things, to see it through and make sure that you can get there. Now, let's see if there's any more questions here. Right. You don't want to just leave him crying because you want to teach him right. That's exactly the point here. You want to make sure you develop a very gentle gentle method here that you can slowly phase yourself out of the picture so your child can learn to sleep through the night and do it in a very, very easy and calm fashion. Okay, so I'm going to sign off now, but if you didn't have a chance to ask me a question, because there were a lot of them, I tried to just like pick general concepts with all of them or go through, please reach out to me, email me, batya at batyathebabycoach.com, and we can be in touch. It's been amazing chatting with you. You all ask amazing questions. I love helping you. And I look forward to hopefully talking to some of you who are ready to make some changes and get the sleep you need, all right? Have a good night, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions.